Doctor Who has managed to cement itself with a sprawling media presence. From comics and books to audio plays, there have been more Doctor Who adventures than a single person could ever consume without going clinically insane. But despite all of this, there has been one elusive frontier Doctor Who has never been able to conquer, video games. There have been a significant number of Doctor Who games in a variety of genres. From text adventures to first person shooters, Doctor Who has always tried to break through the ceiling of video games, with the latest attempt being the VR game Edge of Time. But what is it about Doctor Who that just doesn't translate to gaming? Let's take a look and see for ourselves. Our story begins in the year 1983 with the game Time Lords for the BBC Micro, a console you probably don't know even existed. This wasn't even an official Doctor Who game, which is surprising. Designed by recent school graduate Julian Gollop, this game was a mostly text-based role-playing game designed for up to five players. It's quite in-depth with a pretty fleshed out story. You control one of five warring races, the Daleks, Cybermen, Zabi, Autons and Humans. Obviously these names were changed slightly to avoid the scariest monster of all. These five races have been at war for millennia, although I'm not sure how the Zabi and Autons managed to survive so long against Daleks and Cybermen, but that's beside the point. The war has lasted so long that they have all literally run out of time, so they each enlist a rogue Time Lord, aka the Players, to go back through time and change the history so they win. It's a turn-based strategy, but as someone who has never played these kinds of games, I have absolutely no idea what's going on. It has Dungeons and Dragons style stats and you can lay time traps for other players, who are instructed to leave the room at the beginning of each person's turn. For an unofficial game, it's pretty impressive, but only if you know what you're doing. Another unofficial text-based Doctor Who game, published by Lumpsoft, came out in 1984 for the 48k Spectrum and Commodore 64. The game was called simply The Key to Time, essentially letting you play through a different version of season 16 of the show. There's not much to say about it, I just thought I'd mention it because unlike Time Lords, there were no attempts to shy away from treading all over BBC's trademark toes. It's pretty neat, I'm sure some people might have been fooled into thinking it was the real deal. The first official Doctor Who game came in 1983, titled Doctor Who The First Adventure. Great title guys, real original. This is much more of a game compared to Time Lords, but it's just a reskin of four different arcade games and it has a barebone story based once again around the quest for the key to time. Hey, I guess it's just an easy plot device. And when I say bare bones, I mean bare bones. The story is non-existent. Speaking of non-existent, where's the music? You start up the game and you're treated to a badly drawn TARDIS, along with a weirdly paced version of the iconic Doctor Who theme song, which is the only song in the entire game. But it just cuts out after a few seconds, leaving you in an awkward existential silence as you wonder what pushed you to the point of playing Doctor Who The First Adventure on the BBC Micro. The first level, Labyrinth of Death, is very reminiscent of Pac-Man. A bit too reminiscent. Instead of ghosts, you have to run away from worms. The Doctor is sporting his latest regeneration, a plus sign. If it wasn't for the conveniently placed TARDIS in the top left, you would easily be forgiven in thinking this game had nothing to do with Doctor Who. I'm not sure if it's the outdated keyboard controls, but I found this level really hard. You keep getting stuck on walls, and every time you pick up the objects, the worms get faster, and they always know exactly where you are. After picking up the second key, the worms go so fast that they just catch you instantly. The next level, named simply The Prison, is an egregious ripoff of Frogger. Just look at it. Actually, 
best not. There's not much to say about this. It's just Frogger, but once again ridiculously hard. Dodge the obstacles and cross the street if your eyes don't bleed out first. If you manage to pass this, you'll find yourself in level 3, Pterodactyls. It's Space Invaders. It's literally just Space Invaders. Are you kidding me with this? Once again they just slapped a pixelated TARDIS in the top left to make sure it fit in with the Doctor Who theme. The last episode is called The Box and it's just battleships. What's the point in all of this? One thing I haven't mentioned yet is that you have a time limit in this game. You're given 15 lives and an hour to complete the game, otherwise you lose and it's back to the start. The lives make sense because it's the Doctor who can regenerate, but the time limit is brutal. Each time you die you lose 3 minutes from your run, meaning the time limit shortens quite quickly, especially after the frustrating mess that is the first level. To add the cherry on top of the cake, the cover of the game features the 5th Doctor, who left the role just a few months after the game came out, meaning it was already out of date as soon as Colin Baker took over in March 1984. You're expecting someone else? In 1985, the BBC released Doctor Who and The Warlord. You'd be expecting something flashy, right? It was actually a text-based adventure game. How unique. That being said, it's quite an impressive game. Doctor Who and the Warlord was designed by Graham Williams, who had produced the TV show from 1977 to 1980, before being replaced by John Nathan Turner for season 18. So it's written by someone who knows what they're doing. The game boasts 500 total locations, which you move around in typical text adventure style. You type what you want to do and it progresses the story, although as always it takes a while before you can work out what the game actually wants you to say. Doctor Who and the Warlord places you in the position of the Doctor's companion, and they even future-proof the story by not specifying which incarnation of the Doctor this was. You wake up alone on a battlefield and you have to find the Doctor. Along the way you have to solve puzzles, pick up objects and outsmart enemies before moving on to the second part, where you find yourself at the Battle of Waterloo and have to defeat Napoleon and the titular Warlord. There's not a huge amount to say about this game. It's a run-of-the-mill adventure game, but it's easily the most Doctor Who of the bunch so far, due to it being text-based. I can imagine fans at the time would have enjoyed it quite a lot. However, what came next would shake things up for sure. Doctor Who and the Minds of Terror released on BBC Micro and Commodore 64 in 1986. And it features my favourite incarnation of the Doctor, Nightmares. Seriously Colin, are you okay there? Do you need some help? Did the Rani experiment on you again? This game is the first one in which you can actually see a sprite of the Doctor, and it looks pretty good for the console and the time. You control the Doctor as he explores the minds of Rijar, trying to stop the nefarious master from using a machine to edit the past and make himself last forever by becoming the devil. You know, the usual. The Doctor and the Master were the only properly licensed Doctor Who characters, so the Daleks were represented by a weird bootleg replacement called the Controllers, and we got a robot cat called Splinks rather than Canine. There are also these weird little green aliens running around, but I'm not sure if they're supposed to be enemies or innocent natives of the planet. The game controls like a traditional platformer. You run around climbing ladders and solving puzzles to progress through the game. The map is pretty big, meaning you have to do a lot of exploring. It can get a bit frustrating because some objects will kill you and some won't. My first death came because I walked into an egg, despite there being no indication of eggs being dangerous. So there's a lot of trial and error. There are some interesting mechanics however. The controllers can only move along special metal walkways, and the doctor can only carry four objects at a time, meaning you need to be tactical with what you're carrying around with you. Splinks plays a significant role in the game, because the doctor doesn't have any weapons. Whilst this makes sense, it can get a bit annoying because you are completely defenseless. You don't even get a sonic screwdriver. You have to program basic commands into Splinks to make it attack enemies and collect hard to reach items.
Doctor Who and the Minds of Terror is a game. It's definitely a huge improvement on the first adventure, which was almost insulting with how it ripped off much better games. But the Minds of Terror is actually a proper game. This is most likely because the game started off as a sequel to the popular Castle Quest game, released for the BBC Micro in 1985. Halfway through development, the game was reskinned and rewritten for Doctor Who, explaining the many similarities to Castle Quest. Despite the Minds of Terror being a solid adventure platformer, it didn't sell well. The game was so big that it couldn't fit on the BBC Micro due to the Micro's limited memory. To combat this issue, the game came with a special 16KB ROM chip to install on the system in order for the game to actually run. This ballooned the price, making it sell for £14.95. That's about 40 quid when you convert it to today's values. This meant fewer people wanted to buy it, which was really bad for developer Micropower, because they had poured a lot of money into the game and its marketing. It's often seen as the reason Micropower folded not long after the Minds of Terror came out, and for obvious reasons. For such a forgotten console, the BBC Micro has a surprising amount of Doctor Who games. The Micro was intended as an educational console, but it had a lot of Doctor Who games designed purely for entertainment. None of the games have particularly aged well, but that's always to be expected with games from this time. The text-based adventures are good, and The Minds of Terror is a clear upgrade from the first adventure, but none of them really capture the TV show's feeling of racing through space and time, fighting aliens and monsters with the Doctor. It just wasn't really possible with the games of the time. But you can't exactly fault anyone for trying. However, at the turn of the 90s, gaming faced a revolution. With the improvement of hardware, games saw a drastic improvement in almost every way. Despite Doctor Who no longer airing on TV, it soon found itself knocking on the door of modern gaming. How would these new games on new systems fare? Find out next time, because I have nowhere near enough time left in this video to do them justice. So make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss out on Arcade Daleks and that awkward time when Doctor Who tried to be Quake. Seriously, that's a thing that happened.